Good day, panelists. There's no audio. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We we are going to start. We're just waiting for number. I think we've lost in Tumbi. Uh, while we wait for Hai, I think we're just waiting for a couple more people to join us before we start the session today. My apologies for that. Um, my Wi-Fi went down for a second there. We're going to start now. Um, my name is Ndom Futsinduli. I'm CEO of the South African Wind Energy Association. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, welcome to the second installment of the Developing Developers webinar series, which is hosted by Sab Sabdia and Sawia in partnership with the IPP office. RIFSA and uh, the Black Energy Professionals Association. Um, as the representatives of um, the voices of the solar PV and wind industries, we are constantly working towards collaborating with stakeholders across the renewable energy sector to share knowledge and drive effective change in the sector. So developing the South African developers to build the local competence um, of, of global standards is very key in accelerating local ownership in renewable energy markets in South Africa. Uh, today's webinar, as you'd remember, we started with and just understanding broadly the REAP program. Uh, so today's webinar will focus on the legal outlook, uh, focusing on the types of contracts and agreements that one developers have to go through in order to uh, uh, build the renewable energy projects. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to go through a few housekeeping rules. So to the panelists, I will request you to keep your video off and stay on mute while, while you're not talking in order to improve the sound quality. And then to the participants throughout the webcast, uh, you'll be able to submit your questions to the panelists in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please do that as we go along. We'll read your questions and pose them to panelists at the end of the session. And also make sure that when you ask your questions, state your name, the organization you represent, and the panelists to whom the question is directed. So we are joined by an esteemed panel of speakers today who have years of experience in dealing with uh, legal aspects of the RIP program. So at this point, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists. First up, we'll have uh, Mr. Gozile Zambane, who is a um, COO and partner at Bakaya, uh, at Bayaka Infrastructure Partners. Uh, she will talk to us about the legal structure of the RIP, uh, renewable energy IPPs, companies, including developers, sponsors, funders, etc. Uh, we will then hear from Mr. Alistair Young. She, he is an associate, senior associate uh, from Wabatin Attorneys, who will talk about the RIP contracts and agreements uh, focusing on environmental licensing authorizations, permits, uh, and permitting requirements. And then lastly, we will hear from Mr. Jason Van der Poel. Uh, he is a project partner and head of energy sector at Weber Wenzel at Tennis, and he will give us a presentation on the RIP contracts and agreements, uh, focusing on the power purchase agreements and the implementation agreements. And then finally, uh, Mr. Nivashin Gavenda, who is the COO of uh, the South African PV Industry Association, will facilitate the Q&A session and give us the closing remarks. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to call upon Ms. Togozile Zambane. Uh, she is an admitted attorney and, and, and an entrepreneur. She's committed to playing a meaningful role in the development of the African continent. She spent most of her time as a practicing attorney in the banking and finance a team of Norton Rose Fulbright, where she acted as a, for major corporates, commercial banks, development finance institutions, and state-owned entities. Uh, Togozile has significant experience in structuring, negotiating, deal management, and she has been involved in a number of ground groundbreaking infrastructure development and triple P projects. Um, and she has worked for more than 10 years in the energy sector. Over to you, Togozile. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, Togozile, you are on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to come share with you. Um, I'm honored and I'm honored to have been asked to, to just share some insights in terms of the, construct, the, the legal structuring of WE projects, as well as the contractual um, framework. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So as mentioned, um, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an admitted attorney. My background had been in legal, and I am now the COO of Bayaka Infrastructure Partners. Bayaka Infrastructure Partner is an authorized um, infrastructure fund manager um, with the focus, with the mandate on um, investing in economic infrastructure. And we have a bias towards energy uh, with 75% of our investments will be dedicated towards um, energy projects. And as, as a fund manager, we are really committed to, to really playing a meaningful role in, in, the, in, in the socioeconomic de development on, on, so in socioeconomic development on the continent. Um, we can move to the next slide. I thought perhaps before we get into the legals and the nitty gritty of it, to just take an overview and just take a step back in terms of looking at the South African renewable energy um, sector and the re renewable energy pro um, program. So as you can see, um, a lot of successes in the program and it then becomes quite evident why when the South African government has now looked at the, has, has put together an economic recovery plan, why energy is, energy and infrastructure a huge emphasis has been placed on them, and specifically the need that's been recognised for private party for private um, for the for the private for the private sector to also participate in the funding um, of these projects. Um, I, I think in in, in in the recovery plan, uh, the president speaks of saying that we are able to actually be able to to be able to unlock I think over three hundred billion in funding, um, um, in private sector funding by just focusing on the infrastructure sector. We can, we can really look, we can go to the next set. Yes, so just in terms of unpacking it, um, I'm also mindful of, just before I get into it, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, participants on this webinar really range from, you know, seasoned industry professionals that have been involved in the energy sector for quite a period, uh, for quite a number of years, and that we also have aspiring developers that would want to participate in the REAP program. So um, I will then be pitching my presentation really at a basic introductory level to ensure that um, aspiring developers are, are, are capacitated to actually be able to participate and also hopefully provide uh, the seasoned industry professionals with an opportunity with a brief refresher since it's been close to five years since we were all playing in the space. Um, so maybe this refresher will be a, will be maybe this refresher will be what will be like well timed for all of us. As we kick off now, and then before we really unpack the, the the contractual framework, I think it's really important that we understand who the stars of the show are. And I think very often as lawyers, we like to think that we're the MVPs um, in all these deals. But when we really really consider who the MVPs are, and specifically in the reprogram, you're looking at government. Um, firstly, the South African government for having created an enabling environment for a program like this and for what is considered globally one of the top 10 renewable energy programs. 
Um, the second MVP we'd have is the sponsors, which in my mind, um, sorry, I'm a basketball fan, would be the LeBron James of the MVPs because the sponsors and the IPPs have actually carried that development risk and have actually moved the project along the development curve, a very challenging and a very long process, very costly process, um, in order to get the project to a bankable stage. And then thirdly, we have our contractors, EPC and O&M contractors who are really quite critical in that, you know, they do, they are constructing and operating these power plants and to go out on the limb and, 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 and put their money where their mouths are and put their balance sheets on the line as well. And then obviously um, another critical player that should never be forgotten are the funders because at the end of the day, somebody needs to, somebody needs to pay for, for, for all of these power plants. Um, next slide, please. So when you look at the um, for the at the REAP contractual framework, um, you know it's 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 been clear to see that the six that the successful implementation of large scale projects such as these really hinges on a very complex um, contractual framework that actually ensures that we're able to effectively construct, operate, and finance these projects. And the legal agreements effectively as a start, they you know. As a core, they, 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 they're protecting the revenue. So you're actually ensuring and binding ESCOM to being able to pay, to pay a tariff. Secondly, they're creating um, an enforceable obligation against government and the DOE to provide um, the government support in the event that ESCOM fails to comply with its obligations under the PPA. Um, thirdly, they also then provide, because what's also key is that ESCOM itself as an entity needs to have recourse to, um, to the project developers and to the IPPs. So they provide ESCOM with that, um, with that recourse. And in turn, as I mentioned, you know, we've got the key, a key, a key role player being your contractors. The IPP needs to then have sufficient recourse to those contractors in the event of not of a non-performance on the of, of the plant given that it would have been within the, con the contractor's responsibility to have ensured firstly as an EPC contractor that you are providing um, you're providing a plant at the contracted capacity and as an OM contractor that you ensure that the that the, that the plant continues to operate at the required capacity. And of course, what's also very important in the structure and is, uh, what's quite key is uh, an important agreements is the land. You know, at the end of the day, with no land, you really cannot have a project. We're not able to build them in the sky. So it's quite important that you then are able to have secured land use rights adequately. And then obviously, like I'd mentioned, um, the money bags, the people that make all this possible by, pay, by paying fund, by, by, by putting in some debt, the lenders, and we need to ensure that the lenders are then able to actually get that debt repaid. And of course, the IPPs, the IPP and specifically the shareholders, that they are able to, um, to actually be, to be able to get the necessary return that they were expecting in the projects. Because at the end of the day, in as much as you know, we're trying to build this economy, nobody does, nobody does anything for free. And, and everybody and, 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 and equity participants do want a decent return at the end of the day. Um, and basically, so when you look at the overview of the, of the contractual framework, it then becomes very important that in order to effectively participate in the reprogram, it's so important that you have a full understanding of it so that you're actually able to keep an eye out and manage all of the moving pieces because the moving pieces really have tend to impact each other and have a knock-on effect if not adequately managed. Um, and obviously, at a first glance, you know, if, if this is the first time you are coming across and seeing the contractual framework and the structure of it, it can be very daunting. But um, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And next slide, please. Okay, so at the center and at the core of any renewable energy program is your project, is your project SPV, your project company. It is the entity where all the project rights sit. So from your environmental rights, from your environmental rights, um, to any permitting rights that are any permitting rights that are required, all agreements will be in that project company's name. Um, so at the core of it is this project company and what 
And when you're looking at the project company and the requirement is that this project company's sole purpose, object and business and business needs to be the, the, the running of this project. Nothing else. This project company can't all of a sudden decide I'm gonna go, I don't know, I'm gonna go play in property a bit and and and, and start getting some tenants. So and the, and the reason behind that is because one, you really need to ensure that this project entity, and you want to ensure that it is insolvency remote. You want to know that it's not taking on any obligations outside of the project. And this, again, will give gives lenders the necessary comfort that, okay, if we have ring fenced what it can and can't do, and we have restricted its ability to take certain actions, we can then be sure that this is all that the project company is doing, and we are then able to track um, 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 if all the assets that effectively are owned and managed by this project company. And then what then becomes important, so beyond just um, looking at the one that the project company needs to be ring fenced. So one thing you'll notice that um, for those who, who haven't been in the space or familiar with it, you will, you'll notice that a lot of the project companies have the letters RF behind it. And that's really um, coming from the Companies Act. And it says that in the event, so, so generally companies um, have full contractual capacity, they're able to, to, to run whatever business that they need to be running. But where, a dis, where, where restrictions have been placed or there's been limitations placed on a company's powers, you would then have restricted and you would then have made the necessary amendments to the MOI, which would have then been filed with CIPC. And that's where then you'd have um, the letters RF going after, going after the project company. Um, and what also is important to note is in terms of the REIT structure, there, is, there, there, there are prescriptions regarding shareholding because at the end of the day, the, the program in, in itself and the success it's, it's one thing to, you know, to address the need for um, an electricity backlog, which we do have, and an and, and infrastructure black or backlog, but it's another to, but, but what you have to also have as a balancing act in terms of ensuring that South Africans are actually able to meaningfully participate in these projects. You also need to obviously address historical issues that we have as a country. So you need to ensure that you have the necessary black entity participation. And of course, what is also important is your local community participation, because at the end of the day, this was my home. I live here. I'm just down the road. You've set up this massive power plant and I'm watching all of this revenue come in and out and there's no benefit to me. Um, so there's certain targets and obviously throughout the rounds, you, you'd see a change in it. So um, what you see now, so for example, South African entity participation under bid window five, um, bid window four, so I'm, I'm, I'm in such a rush to get to bid window five, um, was sitting at 40%. That was the requirement. What we're seeing in the risk mitigation round that has moved up to 49, 49%. I think that's quite encouraging because it also speaks to the fact that our energy sector has matured and that we are able, we have, we, we're really starting to have some really strong local players that are actually able to, 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 to construct and, and develop these projects. Um, one thing to note is um, on local community, on local communities, and this was a, 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 a change that we've seen now in the risk mitigation round. There previously was an obligation on project, in, that in your project structure that you had um, a threshold of at least 2.5% for your community with the target being 5%. What we're seeing in the risk mitigation um, RFP, and I don't know if then it is, it's perhaps an indication of what we are, what we can look forward to in future, is that there's now a threshold of zero that's been set, which effectively means that if there's a threshold of zero, you do not need this for purposes of bid compliance. Um, and I and 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 and, you'll, and and what I think perhaps uh, was driving this change is the fact that to have a to have shareholding in a project company where effectively there's still a lot of debt, it really it does not provide any kind of meaningful benefit until such a time that that debt has been settled. So in as much as you can say to a local community, oh, you have a share certificate and you have local communities that are sitting with a share certificate, but at the end of the day, there's no real change in their normal, in, in their day-to-day -day lives. So I think that this move really then will drive a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of developers and IPPs to perhaps consider 
then you know beefing up the other um, economic development obligations because what's really going to make a difference for me if I'm within a local community that is um, that is that is that is that is that, that is close to a power plant or that is with, within that area is the fact that I'll have a job or if I'm a business owner the fact that I will actually I'll actually be provided um, with some contracts. Um, and then also what's very key in the project structuring is that as she, uh, that, so the first major agreement then is your shareholders agreement. Um, and that shareholders agreement really, um, it's the same, same kind of principles in terms of shareholders agreements that you would find in, in any other commercial structure. And that's basically regulating the relationships of the shareholders between themselves and, relate, and the relationship between the shareholders and the project company. Okay, then um, what's also important and the note that's made there in, in relation to equity contributions is that in these energy projects are funded in a combination of debt and equity. So it's really important that you regulate how that debt, um, regulate how the equity contributions are made, because at the end of the day, from a lender's perspective, they would have brought in and dependent on what the gearing would be applied, whether you're looking at 70 30 or in some instances i've seen an 80 20 you want to know as the lenders will want to know that when i put if i have to put in my one rand can you put in what can you also put in yours so what will also then be required is that in that shareholders agreement so you can either put it in the shareholders agreement that these are the equity this is how we're going to deal with equity contributions or i've seen in some projects where it was a separate um, equity contribution agreement that dealt with that and that dealt with the drawdowns and that spoke to the financing documents as well and and followed the regime that, that that's been within the finance uh, within the finance agreement um, next slide please okay so um what then also becomes very important is the um the EPC and uh, the, the construction and operations, and that's really where your EPC and O&M contractor play. Um, again, speaking to to to, to the to, to the South, South African landscape and to ensuring that we have transformation um, that happens in the sector, there is a requirement again for a BE participant in the EPC contractor, and there you'll also see the shareholders agreement in relation to those entities. But what's really key then obviously is the discussions around your EPC and o and agreements. And the negotiations around these can be quite lengthy, quite lengthy and, and, and can be quite contentious. And that's simply because at the end of the day, all construction obligations that you will find in the PPA and in the implementation agreement and in your connection agreements need to, are, are effectively need to be passed through to your EPC contractor. Likewise, all operation agreements in your implementation agreement, your PPA and your connection agreements need to be passed through to, um, to your, to your O&M contractor. So in applying this pass through principle and you'll find you know, in the negotiations of these agreements, because the parties that are quite interested in this is obviously your project company, your IPP, your, con your contractors, but obviously, but your lenders, because at the end of the day, funders want to know what's happening in those agreements. And they really want to, you know, have worked through and, and, and made sure that all of the risks that have been identified have been properly identified and they have been passed to the relevant contractor. So in the process, you know, in, in, in arriving or in negotiating these agreements, it will first be, you know, the process of identifying the risks that sit in the PPA that sit in the implementation agreement, that sit in the, in the, in the, con in the connection agreement, and then saying, okay, how, who, who, where does this risk go? And on a clause by clause basis, then you would be, um, you would be, you would be um, transferring that risk. Um, also, what's very important and a very key, key, key um, clause and a key provision in your, in your, in your EPC and o &M agreement is the fact that the contractors effectively have to bind themselves or have to say, look, look, we are committing that, you know, we will not put the IPP in a position where it will end up breaching um, any of the project agreements, you know, whether your implementation agreement and your, or your PPA or or any other, well, in this instance, your, the, key, the key project agreements. Because obviously at the end of the day, if, if the contractor has taken certain acts and now there's a breach of the PPA and the whole system 
falls down. So at the end of the day, the contractors will then say, look, we're taking the obligation that we will not do anything that will put you in breach and we will indemnify you accordingly for our actions. Um, and then also what's then worth noting and, 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 and what you really pick up in the structure, and it, it's to the point that I was making earlier, that there's, there's so many moving parts, but all of these moving parts really continually speak to each other and are linked to each other. So what's then important then obviously is that the inverse would be true, because if I as the IPP am saying these obligations are the obligations that I'm going to push down to you, then as the EPC or, 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 or an O&M contractor, there's certain kind of claims that I would be making to the IPP under those agreements. And obviously, because that you've got a back-to-back -back arrangement, as an IPP, you then are, you do not want to be exposed and required to, to, to perform or, 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 or to, 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 to make a, a in, be exposed to claims from your contractor that you are not yourself able to claim under the implementation agreement or the PPA. So what then effectively, it, 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 and, and the solution to this is, 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 is what's then referred to as equivalent project relief. And what that really means is that your contractors are only allowed to claim whether it's a payment or time or any other remedy that's then allowable to the extent that the, ID, that the IPP is able to claim under the relevant project agreement. Um, and, and I think that's that's a very important point to make because again, speaking to how it's all um, to how everything is linked up, um, and naturally then there's an obligation then on the IPP because at the end of the day, your EPC contractors, in as much as now they are they have obligations that are stemming from your PPA and your IA, um, there's then an obligation on the IPP that says. You know, if there's claims that need to be made under those agreements, I can't get there because I'm here behind you. You then have to actually go and pursue those claims and be my conduit. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as I'd said, what's very critical to all of this is the land, you know. Um, at the end of the day, if you do not have, if you have not secured your land rights sufficiently enough, you really had you really do run the risk of putting of, 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 of putting the project at risk. So and, and when when I say land use rights, you know, it's land use rights in respect of the project site. So where this power plant is going to be and and in that instance, either you would need to um, as a developer have a have a lease agreement in place. But obviously, this is now a long term lease agreement, bearing in mind that the tenor of that PPA, you're not necessarily, you're not going to get into a five-year lease because you, what's going to happen in five years if you don't get a renewal, of, like I'm going to move the power plant, you know? So you have to have that long-term lease in place and it should also be um, notarially registered. And that becomes quite important um, from a, from, from a, as part, from a lender security pack um, perspective. And, and that's something to also bear in mind that when you're going through all of these major agreements, it all ties back to the funding that's come into the project and the security that the lenders are going to, um, the, 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 the lenders are then going to take. And part of that security package will then also be rights that the project has under, um, um, under the project agreements. Alternatively to a, a lease agreement, a simple sale of land, so a title deed. Um, and again, from a lender's perspective, they would want to then get a bond over the, the either the, 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 the purchased land or in the case of a notarily registered lease, they're able to also get a bond over that. Um, so, and then also, so in, a, in addition to not just the project side, because remember, you need to, as, as an IPP, be in a position to have sufficient land use rights to be able to operate that plant. So it's not, the operation of your plant is not a function of where it's just sitting and located, but it's also, you know, you're going to, in some instances, may need to traverse third party rights, and you'll then need to have land use rights there. Um, and, and what's very important, you know, so in the form of, 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 of servitudes, you know, a, a servitude to be able to put up your, 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 your transmission line or a servitude in respect of um, water 
uh, water pipes that you need to have in place for your, for your for your plant to operate. But what's then very key in 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 your land use rights and in everything about keeping an eye out on the bigger picture is that the you cannot reach financial close until these land use rights have been secured. So. You know, very often there's a delay in getting the serv um, the developers like delay in getting service leads in place. Zile, can, can I ask you to start wrapping up in the interest of time? I had to do this because it's very interesting what you're presenting. Oh, us. sorry, I thought I had, oh my goodness, I thought I had 25 minutes. Sorry, I'll wrap up. Let me continue. Yes. No problem. Sorry, I thought I had more time. No worries. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip this slide because Jason will be dealing with it. Okay. Okay. And then the next slide, then we are looking at again what I've been speaking about, which is the which is the contractual the financing contractual framework that you have in place, and it all boils down to the funding of these projects is really done um, from a project finance perspective, and what that really is is that it's long term finance um, ranging from. 15, 15 year debt to, to 17 year debt. The payback of this funding is really just only linked to the project revenues. It's limited recourse financing, which means that it's off balance sheet and that um, the, the, the recourse that the lenders would have to project sponsors and shareholders is really limited only to the project sponsors shares in the project SPB. But I think it's also very important to highlight that in the context of the REAP, there, is, there are instances where the shareholders' liability will not be limited. And that's then in the, in the instance where lenders have requested sponsor support in respect of a corrupt act that may have been committed by a shareholder um, at breach of an economic development obligation or um, a change in control. Then also what's very key here is the risk allocation. That's quite important. And it also ties back to what what we were speaking about earlier when we we're looking at the EPC and O&M agreement. And the principle there is that lenders want to have the risks that sit with the IP, or that, sit, that are placed on the IPP to be pushed to the contract party that is actually best placed to deal, to deal with them. And, um, and then when you look then further in this regime and a key aspect of your project financing is, your, is, 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 the, is the inclusion of direct agreements because at the end of the day, this is not normal fin financing where if there's a default, you're saying, okay, I'm taking this, I'm going to go sell. There's too many moving parts. So lenders want the ability to be able to step in in the event of a default and prevent um, a major contract party from actually terminating an agreement, um, terminating one of the major project agreements, which again will then speak to an all fall down situation for the project. Um, so in terms of direct agreements, very important to consider which project agreements you're going to identify as being a material agreement that the lenders would want to have step in rights for, and also to agree that upfront with the lenders to try to get an understanding of, okay, what are the key undertakings that you'd want, because again, that, because it's a tripartite agreement, there's a lot of toing and froing in it, um, and yes, of course, there's direct agreements in terms of um, the implementation agreement, or your government agreement, so the implementation agreement, your PPA and your connection agreement so that if necessary, if there's a default by um, the seller or the IPP, they're able to step, lenders are able to step into that PPA. Um, and that really is it. My time is done. I can go to just one last time. I'm not going to speak to it, but I was just a high level overview of the security SPV structure that you will then have to um, become familiar with as a, as a, as a, as an, as an IPP where you'll then um, um, but I'm not going to go into this because I don't want to rush through it and, and I'm rushing through a complicated thing, but these slides are available and should anybody want to discuss this more and get more clarity and understand the specific structure and why we have it in South Africa as opposed to um, as opposed to other jurisdictions, I am I am I'm more than happy to to talk it through to talk it through. Thank you for the time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Togozile. This has been very interesting, and uh, I'm sure questions are going to come up. Um, I would like to ask participants to please post your questions to Togozile on uh, the Q&A function or uh, post on the chat function. I, I just read uh, Nivesh's um, comment on the chat. It's asking that uh, when you post a question, please identify yourself because at, there's a technical glitch. Everyone appears as Kim Smith. 
uh, on the on the list of participants. If you can, please rename yourself, or if you ask a question, please make sure that you identify yourself for 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 for, for our own records. Okay, so we're gonna move on um, to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Alistair Young. Uh, Alistair is an admitted attorney and he specializes in environmental law with a particular focus in drafting and presenting the environmental findings of due diligence investigations for lenders, investors regarding wind and solar uh, projects um, associated with the RIG programs, as well as the coal IPP projects and funding of new mine projects. Uh, Alistair is going to talk to us about environmental authorizations and uh, and licensing requirements related to the new projects. Over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Ntombi, uh, and uh, thanks for the opportunity also to have a, have this chat this afternoon. Um, Togazile mentioned that there's a lot of moving parts on the contractual side of things, and I think what needs to be borne in mind is that uh, while the contractual aspects of these projects are obviously critical, um, we can't lose sight of the environmental um, aspects, uh, which are just as important. And we'll see as we go through the presentation uh, this, this afternoon, the plethora of, of authorizations that are required. And you miss out on one of those authorizations and essentially um, you don't have a project. So that's just a bit of a, a basic background um, as to what I'm going to be talking about, but it's just a bit of an introduction into myself and, and Warburton Attorneys. We located here in Johannesburg, Rosebank, and as as Ntombi indicated, specializing very much in environmental law side of things, renewable energy law. And you can as mention we share an office with Sawia. <laughs> yes. And uh, sharing offices with Sawia for, for quite some time now, and it's, it's a lovely partnership to have. Um, and yeah, we, we represent quite a few of the existing renewable energy developers. We help them with appeals, and I'm going to discuss the appeal process um, as we go along. Um, it, it's probably one of the more nerve-wracking processes that a developer or proposed developer can go through is, is the appeal process um, on environmental authorizations. Um, so yes, can we move on to the next slide? Um, and basically what I'm doing is I'm just giving you, well, I've taken ex extracts out of the, the the risk document that was recently uh, issued by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy and basically gone in and highlighted some of the um, environmental aspects of that. And basically just to start off with some of the, the bid requirements. And um, the first one is um, every bidder will have to submit an environmental authorization as required by NEMA for the project. Um, and if you don't have an existing environmental authorization for your project, then <clears throat> you'll have to show that you've at least commenced with that process um, and you've submitted your applications and you've gone as far as to uh, drafting or got your assessment practitioner to draft your various reports and those reports have been submitted to the department for consideration. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, and where does this need for an environmental authorization come from? Well, it actually comes from the National Environmental Management Act, Section 24F1A, which specifically says that no person may commence with an activity as listed um, until such time that a person has uh, an environmental authorization. Now, there's a very specific definition for commence provided for in Section 1 of NEMA. Um, and there is a bit of case law around that definition, but basically, as soon as you've put your spade in the sand, um, you have, can essentially be regarded as having commenced with um, your listed activities that are applicable to that project. Um, importantly, and it's unlikely to occur within the context of, of the REAP program because essentially you have to show the department that you have at least got an environmental authorization in place or you have um, applied for your environmental authorizations but 
The ramifications of commencing with listed activities without your environmental authorizations are quite significant. Like I said, I don't think you'd even get to, a, to be selected as a, as a successful bidder without, you know, confirming that, you know, all the, the T's have been crossed and all the I's have been dotted with regards to environmental authorizations. But in the event that, you know, you do commence with listed activities without that environmental authorization, you've essentially got to go through a, a post um, commencement authorization process. And the first thing you've got to do is, is pay an administrative fine. Uh, now there's different ways of calculating that administrative fine. And depending on the impacts that those activities will have on the environment will determine the level of the fine that can be imposed. And it can be up to 5 million Rand. Um, and that fine has to be paid before the department will even consider your retrospective application to authorize um, those activities that were not previously authorized. And the payment of that fine, interestingly, does not guarantee um, the, the, that the department will provide you with a favorable authorization. So you could have gone through all these hoops and jumped through all these, um, over all these hurdles to get to that point. And then you realize that you've either missed, it, missed the listed activity um, on your environmental authorization, and now you've got to apply for it, you've got to pay that fine, and there's no guarantees that you are going to get that environmental authorization after the fact. I think within the context of the renewable energy program, like I said, I think it's highly unlikely that it would ever come to that point. Um, and I think if your project has been selected as, as a preferred bid, um, and it turns out that a listed activity was missed, you would have to go through this process. I think it's also under those circumstances highly unlikely that the department wouldn't authorize that listed activity after the fact and after the payment of a fine, but we've just got to bear in mind um, that those are some of the risks of, of commencing with um, listed activities without your environmental authorization. Okay, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a very much a, a flow chart of the environmental authorization process. And basically, when it comes to renewable energy projects, you are going to have to go the full scoping and EIA route. So it is the longer route. Um, it is a 300 to 350 day process. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these steps. The, the, the be all and the end all is the time frame that it takes. And that's the 300 to 350 days, maximum 350 days. And that just, this all depends on if there's any complications during your application. You may have some interest in affected parties who may want some more time to consider the documentation and submit comments on it. And that then pushes out the timeframes to the maximum of 350 days. If you do not, or your environmental consultant who's running this process on, on, on your behalf does not complete the process within the maximum of 350 days, basically what that means is your whole uh, application will then fall by the wayside and you'll have to start, um, start afresh. So it's critical to ensure that your timeframes are adhered to, otherwise you will have to start all over again. The, and, and 300 to 350 days is, is obviously quite a, quite a lengthy time, time period um, within which this process has to follow. There is some potential light at the end of the tunnel. And if we can move on to the next slide, um, the light at the end of the tunnel is that um, the department declared in 2018 some uh, various renewable energy development zones. There are eight of them throughout South Africa, and we can see them all there in that nice map of South Africa. Um, and basically, uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. What that means is that your activity is going to trigger listed at activity one in listing notice two, which is your full scoping and EIA. And that's the development of a project, a renewable energy project with the output of 20 megawatts or more. 
you know, in the in the REIT program, I think it's highly unlikely that you're going to have um, project too many projects being submitted under 20 megawatts. Um, but basically, if you are triggering that listed activity there, 20 megawatts or more, and the various other associated listed activities. Now, just bear in mind, you've got to look at each project um, from a site-specific perspective to determine which listed activities apply. Obviously, this listed activity one and listing notice two will always apply, no matter what. Um, but there will be various other listed activities um, within the various listing notices that will, uh, will apply. Um, now, if your entire proposed facility falls within one of those renewable energy development zones, okay, as you can see there, the word entire is underlined. Your whole development footprint of your project has to fall within um, that um, within a renewable energy development zone. If that is the case, then you can follow the much shorter basic assessment process. And I'll show you the time frames for the basic assessment process um, on the next slide. Um, if so we can move on to that next slide. There we go. That's that's the much shorter process. And as you can see, the main critical uh, uh, aspect there is that the time frame for the department to accept or reject your environmental authorization application is cut down from 107 days to 57 days. And the entire time frame drops down from the 300 to 350 days that you would have had to have done undertaken to 147 to 197 days. And this is somewhat of a recognition by the government is to say, well, you know, we can't have such critical projects, renewable energy projects being delayed and, and developers, potential developers being delayed and being, um, un being unable to submit bids to any bid process because they're still going through these lengthy processes, um, application processes for environmental authorizations. Um, so department recognized this and this is their way of trying to bring down those time frames and saying, well, if your project falls within a renewable energy development zone, then we can go this, um, this much shorter and quicker decision make or application and decision making route. Uh, next slide. If your project falls outside of one of the renewable energy development zones and you trigger that um, listing uh, activity one and listing notice two, the 20 megawatts or more, then unfortunately you have to go the full um, scoping and environmental impact assessment report process, which is the, back to the 300, 350 days. And once again, now I'll reiterate the fact that that word entire was underlined. Um, that means that if part of your project falls within a renewable energy development zone, but another portion falls outside of um, the renewable energy development zone, then unfortunately you have to go the full scoping and EIA route. Um, it's that small section of your project, the development footprint of your project that falls outside of the, the REDS, um, that will then move you outside of that quicker um, time decision-making process. So I suppose the, the word of advice that we can take from this is that you look at that, that map that I showed earlier, you look at the renewable energy development zones, and if you're looking for a project um, or project site, your starting point is to look within those renewable energy development zones and to try and identify a property, a suitable property within those um, zones and, and, and try and ensure that your whole project uh, falls within those zones. And then you can rely on the, the quicker de time decision-making process um, afforded for under, under, this, un, under, under these uh, REDS um, wind and solar PV development zones. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Obviously, it's not just your project uh, development footprint, or the actual wind facility or the uh, photovoltaic um, facility, 
that forms part of the project, but you've also obviously got your, your um, power lines that form part of the project. Um, you have your power lines that come out of the project and hopefully will have to join up with an existing ESCOM um, transmission or distribution line. And part of that um, process that the government has taken in order to try and speed up the decision-making processes is that they've identified these various uh, electric, electric electricity strategic corridors. Um, and as you can see, they are set up quite nicely in that map. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. And what effect that has is that if you undertake listed activity nine in listing notice two, which is the development of facilities for transmission distribution of electricity with 200 and um 275 kilovolts or more and it's outside of an urban area on district uh, industrial complex um then um you can go the shorter basic assessment route now the wording that has been used with um in in this context is the greater part of the proposed facility so your your um transmission uh, or distribution line um falls within one of those strategic corridors, then you can follow the basic assessment route. There's, unfortunately, the use of the word greater has not been defined in the legislation or, or in the government no notice that was um, published that um, declared these um, the corridors. So what is actually meant by the greater parts is, is not certain as far as I know, it hasn't hasn't been um, been the subject matter of any um, judicial consideration, but obviously it means that the majority of the, the project, your, your transmission line would have to fall within that basic, uh, within one of those strategic transmission corridors in order for you to follow the shorter BA process. Once again, let me just remind you, activity nine in listing notice two would ordinarily require you to follow the full scoping um, report process, which is the whole 300 days, um, 300 to 350 days. And if we can move on to the next slide, which is just a reconfirmation of what the shorter basic assessment process is. And that's 147, 147 to 197 days. So it is, it, it does represent a, a very positive saving, um, time saving in terms of your application process. So once again, looking at a project, um, you obviously want to try locate the project itself within one of the development zones, renewable energy development zones. And then if you your, um, your transmission and distribution lines need to hook up obviously with an existing ESCOM line, um, then you would want to try and get your project to or your, your transmission lines to fall within one of those corridors or the greater part of those um, transmission lines to fall within one of those corridors so that you can tap into this um, quicker um, application process for your environmental authorization. Okay, uh, move on. What we have seen fairly recently, and this came out in about June uh, of this year, was that the department has now issued new proposed wind and photovoltaic uh, development zones. Um, the orange ones are the existing ones, um, and the, the highlighted lines are, are your strategic uh, transmission corridors. Um, the new ones that we have here are up there, uh, reds ten, uh, 9 and 10 which are Emlachleni and Klaxdorp. And basically what these are, are for, for solo, uh, solo photo, photovoltaic um, development zones. And essentially what the thinking is around these is where um, mines that are no longer active, it can be viewed as a means for a rehabilitation project for those mines. So, the two that I've just mentioned there are solely for photovoltaic projects. And then we've got one down in the Western and Eastern Cape, uh, the Beaufort West uh, red zone, which is pretty much, well, is focusing on, on new wind energy projects. So once again, the same principles as discussed um, with regards to the existing reds and corridors would apply within the context of, of these new 
um, proposed or the proposed new wind and photovoltaic um, development zones. Um, okay, moving on. Um, in my introduction, I, int I just mentioned um, when you're going through this environmental authorization process, you process, you've got to engage or your assessment practitioner has to engage with interested and affected parties. And during the application process, you've got to present the project to interested and affected parties. And um, they've got to comment on, on the project, their concerns associated with the project. Um, you don't really see too many concerns on the photovoltaic side of things. Um, although there are, there are some concerns where we are seeing quite a lot of um, interest um, from interested and affected parties and a lot of comments coming in is on, on the wind projects. Um, obviously, a lot of residents see it as, as a bit of an eyesore on, on, on the landscape. Um, and so they submit their comments. If a positive environmental authorization is issued by the department, then those interested and affected parties do have a, another um, opportunity, and that is through the appeal process provided for Section 43 of NEMA. And essentially, any interested and affected party has a right of appeal, and that process is provided for in the appeal regulations. And the net effect of an interested and affected party submitting an appeal is that it suspends your environmental authorization until such time that the appeal process is finalized. Um, so that can have a, a, a knock on effect. And that um, the REAP documents do require um, you to set out if you have been issued with an environmental authorization, whether that environmental authorization is the subject matter of any appeal processes. Um, we have been involved in a number of appeals on, on wind energy projects. And um, if we can move on to the next slide, one of the developing trends that we are seeing specifically, specifically within, the renew, uh, sorry, within the wind energy sector is our appeals related to the issue of wake effect uh, and turbine turbulence. And I think this is going to come up a whole lot more within the South African context, um, specifically if we are seeing uh, potential developers looking to develop within those renewable energy development zones. Obviously, there are existing projects within those zones. And um, what we are going to see is obviously um, developers looking at those zones because they are obviously known wind resources. Um, and there's existing infrastructure there. You've got these nice um, time frame um, benefits with regards to your environmental authorization process. And so what you do is you go and identify suitable land in, in those zones and you submit your environmental authorization application and you've then got a neighboring existing wind farm and they start submitting comments around the potential for the, 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 the new or the proposed wind facility to have a wake effect on the existing facility. And for those of you who don't know what a wake effect is, is that essentially the new project would be, um, would be placed upwind of the, of the existing uh, facility. So it becomes, essentially becomes first in, in, in time in terms of getting the, the available wind re resource. And this picture that we are looking at here just shows what happens as the wind uh, moves through a turbine it causes a, a turbulent effect on, on the wind as it passes through, through, the, through, the, uh, through the turbines. And essentially what it does is then that wind, the quality um, and quantity of, of, of the wind that, that is then available for the existing downwind facility is far more reduced. So the quantity of wind is reduced so that has an impact on the ability of the existing wind farm to produce electricity. It also has a, an effect on, on the turbines in the sense that you can see how turbulent 
the, the wind is once it's passed through the, the turbines. And instead of your turbines turning in a nice concentric circle, it causes the turbines to oscillate. And that has an impact on, on, the, uh, on the wear and tear of, of the turbines. And so this is now becoming quite, quite an issue within the South African context. And so far we've seen three major appeals. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, three major appeals from um, existing wind energy developers. And the first one, the first one that we saw was um, brought by the Noport Wind Energy Facility. And that was in um, response to the proposed Physical Moya and Sankral Wind Energy Facilities. And as you can see, um, they were located or proposed to be located in close proximity to, uh, to Noport. And Noport said, well, these two facilities are gonna have a wake effect impact on, um, on our facility. And I think it was in the re region of, of, of around 1% uh, impact on the ability of them to, 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 um, to produce electricity or 1% or reduction in the existing um, energy production. Um, potentially doesn't sound big in, in the grand scheme of things, um, but obviously a lot of financial models were based on um, what they were able to produce, the new farms come along and it reduces that ability and it then throws a lot of those financial models out. Um, an appeal was submitted, it was appealed under the guard of the former minister, uh, Minister Mokanyani, and she came back on her appeal decision and said, well, in, in my opinion, uh, wake effect is not a concern within the realm of, of an environmental authorization application. Um, uh, Noport also asked for the environmental authorization for the two facilities to include a, a contractual clause within it that, that placed an obligation on the parties to enter into a, a, a compensation agreement. Um, so the two new facilities would compensate Noport for the losses um, and, and the minister uh, said that is also beyond the, the realms of, of, of what an environmental authorization is required to include and the, uh, the appeal was dismissed. Just that, that was quite a couple of years ago now, about, about one and a half years ago. Just to give you a quick update on this, um, San Kral and Feza Kamoya, the developers of these two facilities, have decided to split each one of the facilities up into two um, separate or up into four uh, separate developments. They've applied for a splitting of the environmental authorizations. That has now provided no point with a new bite at the cherry, at the appeal cherry. And it's my understanding that they have submitted appeals against the decision to allow the split of, of the environmental authorizations. And it will be interesting to see where that comes out because since um, the original appeal decision, we have now had two subsequent appeal decisions. So if we can move on to the next slide. And these two appeal decisions were issued under um, the current uh, Minister for Environment, uh, Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, Minister Creasy. And this was down in the uh, Port Elizabeth area, and um, Bayview being the, uh, sorry, Grass Ridge being the existing facility and Bayview being the proposed new facility. And Bayview would have had a, a substantially greater impact on, on, on the Grass Ridge facility than what would have occurred on the no port. And the appeal was submitted against uh, the environmental authorization being issued for the Bayview, proposed Bayview facility. And basically the attorneys for, for Grass Ridge um, in their appeal um, made reference to a constitutional law case, which is basically referred to as a fuel re retailers case. And in that judgment by the constitutional court, and that case really revolved around a new petrol station being constructed in close proximity to an existing petrol station. And the existing petrol uh, station said, 
the environmental impact, sorry, the economic impact of that new facility on the existing, on our existing petrol station wasn't considered during the environmental authorization application process. And basically what the constitutional courts um, came out and said in that matter was that it was imperative during the environmental authorization application process um, to take consideration of the economic impact of a proposed development on existing developments. And so what the, the attorneys in the Grassridge matter did was use the decision from the constitutional court case and applied it within the context of wind energy facilities and said, look, Minister uh, Creasy, there's this constitutional law case that says economic impacts of a proposed development on existing development have to be considered. Um, there was no wake assessment impact done on, uh, by the proposed or the developers of the Bayview wind energy facility. It didn't form part of the environmental authorization application process. You didn't have all the information before you. You couldn't consider the impacts, the economic impacts of the proposed development on Grass Ridge. And, and on that basis, um, you have to set the, the environmental authorization aside. Uh, Minister Creasy agreed. She set the environmental authorization aside and told the developers of Bayview to go back, do their impact, uh, the wake assessment impact, wake as impact assessment and, and resubmit um, the application together with the assessments for, for consideration again by the department. So quite a different uh, approach to the, the former minister, very much in line with the constitutional court decision. Um, what the grassroots attorneys also asked for was a similar clause to be included in the environmental authorization, um, that a condition be included, that an agreement has to be reached between the two parties um, before any development can, be, can take place regarding um, a compensation for any wake impact. Once again, Minister Creasy said that is not the scope of an environmental authorization and refused to, to uphold uh, or dismiss that, that ground of appeal. Um, uh, Alastair, can I ask you to start wrapping up? Sure, okay. Um, most recent case is um, the West Coast One uh, development or the proposed boulders development. Uh, the developers of West Coast One, um, this, this development would have had a more than 2% wake effect impact on West Coast One. Developers of West Coast One um, submitted an appeal against the environmental authorization for boulders. The appeal was successful, very much citing the same grounds. Minister Creasy cited the same grounds as what she cited in um, her decision on, on the Grass Ridge matter. And um, she, and, and the the, the appeal was upheld. Um, so the developers of or the the developers of the proposed boulders facility have to go back and do the wake assessment and resubmit the application. So the, the take home from this is if you are a proposed developer and you've identified a suitable site that's in close proximity to an existing wind energy facility, you must get your environmental assessment practitioners to do a wake assessment impact. If you don't do that, you are going to be heading into this appeal process that then just drags things out. And, and I can guarantee you, based on the two decisions that we now have from the minister, the appeal will be successful and you will have to go back and do that wake assessment um, in any case. So just do it as part of your original environment authorization application. It is very much a developing um, topic within the sector. So please take note and, and do, do what, what is required under the circumstances. Okay, moving on, we're just gonna have to quickly move through, through these next slides to, to wrap up. Water requirements, very much applicable within the context of solar photovoltaic um, and concentrated solar projects. Um, obviously, they are located in fairly arid regions of South Africa. Um, they do very much need, well, they do need a lot 
of water, particularly in the uh, construction phase of, of the projects, but they do need water also within the operational phase. Um, so that's where the water use license requirements come along um, in, within that context. Um, moving on to the next slide quickly. Um, let's, let's, I won't go into the nitty gritty, let's just get on to the, 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 the water use requirements. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is this is the one. So basically, we've got Section 21A water uses, which is the taking of water from a water resource, which is very much applicable within the context. This is the up the picture in the top left hand corner. Um, Section 21B storage of water, not potentially applicable within the context of, of solar projects, but you, yeah, uh, that's probably is tri triggered. Section 21C, we do see this in the context of wind projects as well. Um, you have to build roads on your sites. Often there aren't, aren't roads and they cross through uh, streams, uh, water courses. You've got to build some, a culvert and, and a little bridge over that, uh, over that water course. And that triggers your Section 21C and your Section 21I water uses. Um, if we can move on to the next slide quickly. There's just a synopsis of your solar energy facilities, uh, the water uses that are, are, are triggered by that. Um, your F, G and H are typ typically your, um, your disposal of waste because obviously in your photovoltaic there's, there's quite a lot of wastewater that's generated um, through those processes. And, and you've got to dispose of it. So that's where those water uses come in. And just quickly um, to move on to the, the next slide, as your wind energy facilities, your A, B, C, and I water uses, basically you can either, uh, you will either trigger a general authorization, which is your much quicker um, water, use pro, uh, water use license process. Um, if but you have to fall below certain thresholds. And those are the next slides, the next few slides where I'll set those out. Um, and I'm not gonna go through them, um, but basically you can apply for a general authorization. It's a very quick, very simple process. Um, and you get issued with a water use, uh, with a general authorization certificate. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. Um, that sets out the process, 30 working days, um, but you can only commence your, your water use once you get issued with that uh, registration certificate. Your water use license process is set out on the next couple of slides. Um, currently, 300 days to apply for and get issued. That's what the legislation says. Unfortunately, the Department of water, Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation is not that reliable. Um, if we can move on to the next slide sets out the, the process for applying for your water use license. Um, 300 days, notoriously bad in sticking to those 300 days. The, uh, the president in his um, State of Nation address at the beginning of the year did call on the department to reduce that process. The department issued um, a media statement in June this year, and they said they are now moving towards a 90 day decision making process. Um, who knows when those regulations will be amended to reflect that 90 day process, but that's the aim of the department. They rarely stick to 300 days. So whether they can actually <laughs> deal with a 90 day process, it, it remains to be seen. But in order to stick to that 90 day process, they are going to allow you to do certain application of these steps that I'm that you see in these slides outside of the application process, you will be able to tap into your public participation process associated with your environmental authorization application to, to try and, uh, you know, just uh, align all the application processes. Um, so that's, that's the water use license process. If we can just quickly move on to uh, waste management license that comes into play in very much um, within your uh, concentrated um, solar uh, facilities. Uh, the next slide is a picture 
of a concentrated solar facility down in the bottom left hand corner there. You see some evaporation dams where all the wastewater is disposed to. Generally, you need a waste management license for that process. The nice thing about applying for a waste management license is you can align it with your environmental authorization application um, and, and you can do it as, as, as one process. So you would definitely then align those two processes. There are a number of other environmental authorization application processes. You've got to get consent from the Minister of Mineral Resources um, to, to confirm that the land on which you want to do your development doesn't have, um, doesn't have any mineral uh, interest. Um, you've got to get your electri uh, electricity generation license. Generally, most of the land where you are setting up your facility is zoned for agricultural purposes. You have to get um, confirmation of change in loan, land zonation. Your project needs to get building approval. Most sites have some sort of heritage um, artifacts on them. Buildings, let them be buildings or grave sites, archaeological sites. So you have to get your permits for your heritage sites. Up in the north, in the Northern Cape, where a lot of your uh, facilities, your uh, two more still, minutes to wrap up, Alistair. Two more, that's perfect. Sure. Where your um, solar facilities are going to be developed, have a lot of protected tree species. Um, I've got two slides at the end, which which uh, give a good example of that. But you've got to get a permit to cut, destroy, or chop any of those protected tree species. We can move on to the next slide. Um, Civil Aviation Authority required. Um, there's various registration processes that you have to go on, uh, go through under the Waste Management Act, which are over and above your waste management license process. You have specifically within the Northern Cape, um, you've got to get perm permission from the Square Kilometre Array that your facility is not going to have an impact on the Square Kilometre Array. If it is, and the square kilometre array has to introduce various mitigation measures, um, then you will have to pay for those um, uh, mitigation measures, but you can claim them back um, through a, a, a process um, or those, those costs through a process. Um, and then just quickly wrapping up, there are various other municipal processes to, to bring home the, um, the impacts that can, uh, sorry, if we can move on to the next slide. This uh, concentrated um, solar facility up in the Northern Cape was located very close to a camel thorn forest. forest. Um, because of that, and they had to chop down over th a thousand camel thorn trees and that were found on the preferred site, this project had to set aside a, um, a, a piece of land, um, an off piece of offset land, biodiversity offset land. So essentially they had to purchase a piece of land and ensure that that uh, property wasn't developed and the trees uh, on that, so the camel thorn trees on that property uh, were protected for all time. It was it's been registered as a protected area. And these are just some of the things that you potentially don't consider when you are developing or conceptualizing the project, but they come up during the environmental authorization processes. Um, so we have, as going back to my initial comment at the start of this period, you consider the commercial aspects of a project at the beginning, do not underestimate the environmental aspects. They are significant. You skip or miss a hurdle and it can cause your project to fall flat. That's where I'm going to end off. Um, thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, we can deal with those at the end. Uh, thank you so much, Alistair. That was very interesting. And I know this is a topic that uh, actually requires a whole day seminar, because if we talk about legal contracts, uh, there's a lot that needs to be considered. But uh, thank you for making time to impart your knowledge to our audience. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, our last speaker for today is uh, Mr. Jason Van uh, Jason is a partner and head of energy sector group at Weber Wenzel. Um, he has uh, 12 years energy sector experience and uh, overall experience of 18 years. And he's got expertise in a range of areas in uh, project finance. Uh, he's advised lenders, sponsors, contractors, and uh, he has worked a lot with triple P's, IPP's, and uh, advising on various uh, legal 
uh, matters and operations contracts. So over to you, Jason. Uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, PPAs and implementation arguments. Thank you, Ntombi. Thank you to my um, esteemed speakers, uh, Tokazila and Alistair that have gone before. It's a hard act to follow. And thank you also to Marilise, who behind the scenes is changing the slides um, out of the view of the, the audience. And thank you also to the audience for, for making this time to listen to all of us. Um, Marilise, could I ask you to move to the next slide, please? So just in terms of agenda, I will talk through uh, a very brief introduction of the, the projects team at Weber Winsor. That, are, that, that will be focusing on the Renewable Energy IPP Procurement Program and are currently focusing on the Risk Mitigation IPP Procurement Program at the moment. Um, then we'll talk about the structure and components of those two procurement programs very, very briefly because these things have been touched on by Tokazira already in a fair amount of detail. An important thing to note there is that we don't know what the RFP precisely is going to look like for the fifth round of the Renewable Energy IPP Procurement Program. And the reason why I brought in some discussion on the risk mitigation IPP procurement program is that it may give us some indicators as to what might be in round five um, of, of REAP. Then we'll focus squarely on the power purchase agreement and the implementation agreement. These are two documents that are non-negotiable and are part of the RFP. And it's uh, among the conditions that you agree to those documents as they stand with their terms. And through the four rounds, five rounds of, of REAP that we've already had, these documents have proven to be bankable and acceptable commercially. So that at least is a very good sign. Marilise, next slide, please. And the next. So that's the, the, the very attractive looking Weber Wenzel team that is focusing on, on projects. Um, I think that some of you will know that there is a team within Weber Winsel that has been advising government on the renewable energy IPP procurement program and also the risk mitigation program. And that team is specifically named on the IPP office website and there is a very strict ring fencing. So these people that you see on this slide are those that are at liberty to act for the private sector in developing, lending to, sponsoring uh, projects or acting as contractors or operators. Um, I won't go into um, any further detail on the team, save to say that we have land specialists, environmental specialists, corporate um, projects, project finance specialists. And um, so it's a, it's a range of, of skills wrapped into the one team at Weber Winsel, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can skip through this the next and the slide after that. These are slides just um, demonstrating some things about Weber Wenzel and some of the accomplishments that, that we have. We've advised many parties in the REAP program uh, to date in, in all of the rounds, uh, different types of projects from CSP to um, PV to wind to biomass. And um, we've also advised lenders, contractors, so not just the, the project sponsors and developers. Um, next slide, please, bonus. This is the very broad structure of the REAP program request for proposals. You have part A, which sets out requirements and rules. These are all general rules that um, set the parameters of what is and is not allowed. Um, so basic ones like don't collude with other bidders in the program. Uh, some of them are quite obvious. Um, and the Department of, of Mineral Resources and Energy reserves quite a wide discretion to to uh, take action to the extent that you um, that you breach some of these rules and requirements, including exclusion from the project disqualification from, from the program itself. Then very cleverly, this RFP has a section called the qualification criteria, and these set out a number of boxes that must be ticked before your project can move through to the evaluation criteria, which are in part C of the RFP. So the qualification criteria are made up of the legal criteria, which include land and environmental and all the permitting that Alistair was just speaking about. It also includes economic development criteria. So things like your level of black ownership at project company level, your level of black ownership at um, EPC and ONM contractor level, the amount of job creation that you will um, that you will induce through this project. There are some financial qualification criteria, and those focus on the track record and the net asset value 
of the uh, providers of debt and equity finance. And then there are some technical qualification criteria, like making sure that you use the right sort of solar panels or the right sort of inverters or the right sort of wind turbines. And then finally, capacity. Those are the capacity limits of the plant. So wind farms can't be above 140 megawatts and solar farms can't be, um, can't be above 75 megawatts for solar photovoltaic. And for uh, concentrated solar powers, they may not be larger than 100 megawatts. Um, I wonder if these thresholds will change in Reef Round 5. I suppose we'll have to wait and see. And then in Part C, the comparative evaluation or the, the um, evaluation criteria, there are only two evaluation criteria, economic development and price. And the weighting is 70% on price and 30% on economic development. And economic development is made up of ownership, management, job creation, local content, preferential procurement, enterprise development, and socioeconomic development. Marley's next slide, please. So this is the structure of the RFP for the risk mitigation IPP procurement program. Noting that the renewables program focuses only on renewable energy technologies, the risk mitigation program is an emergency program that focuses on, um, on uh, well, they say it's technology agnostic. So as long as you meet certain technical criteria, then any technology ought to be allowed to participate. But when you read the documents more carefully, you realize that this program is focused more squarely on dispatchable uh, power, and it can be supported by renewable energy. So you'll, you'll notice that the RFP follows distinctly the same format as the renewable energy IPP procurement program format. So part A, part B being the qualification criteria, and part C being the evaluation criteria. But interesting to note that potentially because of the emergency nature of the power procurement under the risk mitigation program, the weighting for price and economic development is 90% on price and 10% on economic development. So arguably economic development is slightly less important under the risk mitigation um, IPP procurement program because of the emergency nature of it. Next slide, please. This is a, a conceptual project overview. And um, I think probably Tokazile's diagram was a bit better than my diagram. But the reason why I'm flashing this up in particular is to lead into my, my next topic, which is specifically the power purchase agreements and the implementation agreements. And this shows where those fit in, in the broader scheme of things in, in these projects. Everything starts with government. So Minister Grede Mantasha issuing a ministerial determination under the Electricity Regulation Act saying, I'd like to procure a certain amount of power. So the DMRE is where he sits and the DMRE is designated in Minister Mantasha's determination as the procuring entity. And um, he puts out the, the request for proposals and these shareholders, uh, the, the BE shareholders, local communities, they come together in a consortium to establish a project company that will then hold the project, will enter into a power purchase agreement with ESCOM. So ESCOM buys the power and pays the project company money for that. And it enters into the implementation agreement with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So that is the agreement where the project company undertakes to make certain um, economic development outcomes become a reality, like job creation, black ownership, management control, preferential procurement, enterprise development, and, and the things that, that we listed before. And the DMRE in turn undertakes that it will provide government support. So to the extent ESCOM defaults on a payment that it's meant to make under the power purchase agreement, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy will step in. It has a charge against the National Revenue Fund. So um, government backs the payments of, of ESCOM in a very particular way under this implementation agreement. And we'll see some of the other contents of the implementation agreement. Um, you'll see also in this diagram, all the things that Tokazile spoke about before, the lenders on the left, the shareholders on the right, the EPC for construction down below, the, the O&M um, uh, uh, contracted down below, a block for environmental and regulatory uh, permitting. That's a very important aspect of these projects. Um, you also see fuel supply in renewable energy projects like a, a wind farm and, and a solar uh, PV facility. There will be no fuel supply because um, it's um, the natural resource of the wind 
and the sun are the things that fuel those projects if you don't have to pay for them effectively. Um, whereas if you are doing a biomass project, for example, you would need to get a supply of whatever it is that you are combusting in order to produce that, that energy. Next slide, please. So with, with that, we'll jump straight into the, the PAR purchase agreement. And this is a very broad, um, uh, this is a listing of all of the substantive clauses inside the power purchase agreement. So this ought to give you a good um, sense of the anatomy of the power purchase agreement. The first point to note is that the parties to the power purchase agreement are the seller, so that is the independent power producer, the project company, and the buyer is Eskom Holdings State-owned company limited. There has been quite a bit of talk about an unbundling of Eskom and whether there'll be an independent transmission system and market operator that will be split out of ESCOM, first as a subsidiary of ESCOM Holdings, and then secondly, splits uh, all the way out of ESCOM so that it's a totally independent entity. That, um, that move will be quite a change in our markets and would serve in my mind to liberalize the market and facilitate the private sector participating in these projects. So that in my mind would be a very good thing. Then under clause one, definitions, there are a couple of important concepts that I think it's worth speaking through. The first is achieved capacity. That is how much energy the plant will be able to produce when it is operating at full capacity. So if it's a wind farm, um, depending on the, in the, the ordinary course of a day, a week, a year, you'll be able to de determine how many megawatts and how many megawatts hours this project will be able to produce. And that is determined in a moment of testing, and you'll see clause four speaks of testing and commissioning, where an independent engineer is brought in to um, run a series of tests over a period of time and follow a very uh, formal and, and official process to determine what the achieved capacity of the plant is. Once you've determined what that achieved capacity is, the, the plant can then get um, commissioned and it is commissioned um, on a date called the commercial operation date. So everything leading up to the commercial operation date is, is known as the construction phase, the development or construction phase. And then on the commercial operation date, you then enter into a new phase, the operating phase. And that operating phase has a term of 20 years. So for 20 years, you're allowed to run this project and, and earn money for the energy that you're producing and selling into the national grid to ESCOM. And um, what, what you are then selling is commercial energy, and you get what is known as the commercial energy payment, which is defined in the power purchase agreement, linking to the tariff that, that each bidder bid in um, during the bid submission phase um, on a competitive basis. And projects will have been chosen on the basis of the competitiveness of that price. And you all know that over the various rounds of, of REAP, the tariffs have steadily dropped, um, indicating that the competitive system of evaluating these projects is really working along with the uh, decreasing and, and increasingly competitive world market for renewable energy and renewable energy inputs. So commercial energy um, is, is what you get paid for as an IPP. But if you connect to the grid um, before the commercial operation date, or the scheduled commercial operation date, you get what is known as early operating energy, which is slightly less than the commercial energy payment, but it is a way to make money if you, um, if you build your plant very quickly and very efficiently. So that is an incentive to, to finish your, your project earlier than scheduled. If you, if you are late for the scheduled commercial operation date, there's some penalties, which, which um, essentially are that for every day that you're late, you lose, lose a day at the end of your PPA term, which is quite, um, which is quite punitive because um, all of a sudden you can see your, your, the, the term, the time during which you'll be able to earn money with this power purchase agreement shrinking with each day that you're late. So parties are incentivized to organize themselves very well and to achieve this construction within the shortest possible time. There, there are another series of important concepts in the power purchase agreement, which are quite legal in nature. One of them is the compensation event. And um, compensation events, you'll see in, in clause 15, consequences of a compensation event. 
That is when, when um, the government party, that is ESCOM, is in breach, but not uh, a government default, but a, a compensation of it. And that is defined as, as any breach, which essentially doesn't constitute a, a, um, a, a government default. There are only a couple of government defaults, and those um, are the most drastic ones, like expropriation, et cetera. So if there's a compensation event, then um, you receive compensation. You get paid an amount to make whole for that. Then you'll see in clause 15, uh, sorry, clause 14, consequences of a system event. That is what happens. A system event is what happens when the grid is not available to take the power. You'll know that wind farms and solar farms don't really choose when they dispatch. Um, it, it happens when the wind blows for wind farms and when the sun is shining for, for solar projects. Um, and the system event happens when the national grid, the distribution network or the transmission network cannot take the power um, for whatever reason. And when that happens, you get what is known as a deemed energy payment. So um, that is an amount that is quantified. I, I think the uh, financial analysts that I've spoken with say that it amounts to roughly 60% of the commercial energy payment. And it's a payment that gets made to you for the energy that you could probably have sold into the grid had the grid been capable of taking your power. And this is a big, a big um, issue where um, the grid is in desperate need of maintenance in certain parts of, of South Africa and the grid needs strengthening. Um, you would have seen the press covering reportage around how much money Eskom is planning to spend on strengthening our, our national grid and expanding it. That's a very big and important issue. Another important um, item or concept in the power purchase agreement is force majeure. And I think everyone became a, um, a closet or not so closet expert in force majeure when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit and everyone was trying to understand what, what consequences it would have on contracts. And strangely enough, COVID-19 did not fall under the definition of force majeure under the, the power purchase agreement. In the Renewable Energy IPP Procurement Program, force majeure is very strictly defined as a closed list of very specific items like militants, insurrection, um, civil unrest, um, a, um, I think it, it mentions uh, tempest, uh, storm, um, things like that, think acts of God that, that cannot be controlled, but it's a, it's a closed list which never included um, uh, a global pandemic. So interestingly enough, you'll see in the risk mitigation IPP procurement program that force majeure definition is now an open definition, which does include the, uh, the pandemic. And what was interesting about this was as soon as the pandemic hit, people were saying, well, wait a minute, isn't there a, a force majeure? But realized that the, the power purchase agreement said that there was no force majeure under these conditions. Yet, under certain underlying contracts like EPC contracts and ONM contracts, parties had negotiated that a pandemic would be a force majeure. And then you had a very strange situation where the IPP, the seller um, or the, the project company, had to recognize a force majeure of its contractor, but ESCOM wasn't recognized, recognizing it as having a force majeure. And that underscores the need for what Tokuzile referred to earlier on in the presentation about pass through. You need to pass through those risks. Otherwise, um, the project company, whose sole job it is, is to do this project to, and, and to earn money off it, um, it, it then becomes exposed to liabilities that it cannot control. So that is a word on force majeure. And then another important concept under the power purchase agreement is unforeseeable conduct. And that is the term that has essentially been given to what happens when the law changes or a a regulatory authority does something which causes prejudice to the project, which was unforeseeable um, at the outset of the project. And what you get there is, is some kind of compensation, either money in a lump sum or money over time to compensate you and put you into the position you would have been in had that unforeseeable conduct not happened. Interestingly enough, when there's force majeure, you don't get money. Um, you're excused from having to perform and the only uh, recourse that you can get for force majeure is an extension of the term of your power purchase agreement. And there's a certain maximum. So um, you will get extra days 
added on to your to your power purchase agreement term for every day that a force majeure has happened. Another important concept that comes up in the power purchase agreement is the lender direct agreement. And if you remember the diagram that I showed you, you saw the lenders on the one side, you saw the project company on the one side, and you saw ESCOM and the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy as the parties to the power purchase agreement and the implementation agreement, respectively. And that direct agreement is a, a creates a direct contractual linkage between the lenders, ESCOM, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, and of course the project company. And what it allows the lenders to do is if there's a, a, a default or a default that is looming where the project company has some issue and cannot pay down the, the debt or something's happening in the project that looks like it's going to head into default, then the direct agreement allows the lenders to step into the project to take a measure of control for a certain period called a step-in period and to try to, to fix whatever issue is causing this trouble. Because of course, the lenders have quite a vested interest having injected between 70 and 80% of the value of the project in order to have it uh, built, they have a vested interest in seeing that project work and it's earning money so that they can not only recover their debt, but so that the sponsors can actually get paid their equity as well. So that is another important concept under the power purchase agreement. Then the, we've spoken a little bit about transmission and distribution. You connect to your project to one or other of those networks, and that allows for the flow of electricity to where it needs to be and um, hopefully our homes and hopefully not load shedding. Um, a couple of other important concepts in the power purchase agreement are government default, and that is referred straight across to the implementation agreement where that is defined. And like I said, those are the most um, drastic things that government can do. And there are only a few of them, including expropriation. So if, if the government expropriates your project, then um, there, there is recourse and a particular um, particular termination amount that you can get paid, which will cover all of the debt and, and all of the equity. Um, there, there are a number of, of seller defaults that are listed in the power purchase agreements, and these are the things to be the most sensitive about, because if one of those things happen, then ESCOM is able to terminate the power purchase agreement, and then you will stop being able to earn money from this very expensive uh, plant that you put onto this project site. And the seller defaults that can cause this, this form of termination are things like insolvency of the seller, the failure to commence construction when you're supposed to, not achieving the commercial operation date by the last commercial operation date, last COD, which is 18 months after the scheduled commercial operation date. Um, it's what happens if the National Energy Regulator of South Africa revokes your, your license because you've breached one of the license conditions that they've set for you. Um, if the independent power producer abandons the project, um, if the implementation agreement is terminated for whatever reason, if you change your shareholdings or change your, your uh, control of your project without the consent of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy when it's required, um, that um, also triggers um, a, a seller default and certain other breaches also trigger seller defaults. Those are the most drastic things that can happen and those can cause your, your power purchase agreements to be terminated. So those are the key concepts that I wanted to cover in the power purchase agreement. Marilise, if I could ask you to move to the next slide. Thank you very much. These, this is just a slide showing the schedules to the, the power purchase agreement and they include details of the project and facility, completion milestones and forms of notices, especially the notices around testing and commissioning. Um, it gives detail around scheduled and unscheduled outages, forecasting information because the, the plants um, um, will tend to generate whenever the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, and you give a weekly forecast and also a daily forecast in advance so that ESCOM can plan how much power it will have on any given day and uh, will determine whether it has a shortage or surplus. Um, there's a list of firms that will act as independent engineer for purposes of testing and commissioning, some details of the deemed energy payment, 
They list the project documents, the direct agreement, which we spoke about, um, more detail on outages, and then the form of budget quotes, effective date confirmation. The budget quote is the, um, the letter that you get from ESCOM that speaks to exactly how ESCOM is going to connect the project to the, to the grid. Next slide, please. Just a brief word on the risk mitigation IPP procurement program power purchase agreement. It, it has a, a very similar structure to the REAP power purchase agreement in terms of the, the clause headings, as you will see, but there's some fundamental differences. One of them is that this power purchase agreement is more, more focused on dispatchable solutions. In other words, um, a gas-fired plant or a diesel-fired plant, um, which can produce energy on demand, almost like the, the Pika projects uh, or Ankelik and Barikwa, which are ESCOM's power stations that run on diesel at the moment. They, they are quite expensive. Um, and as a result, the risk mitigation IPP procurement program allows sponsors to add on the renewable energy portion, which, um, which is the non-dispatchable facility that might be part of these projects. And so this power purchase agreement has to cater for both of those. But some of the key differences that we've seen in, in, um, in between these two power purchase agreements would include things like carbon tax. Obviously, um, the emission of carbon is not an issue under a renewable energy um, power purchase agreement, but is where there's a project with a, a um, diesel or a gas-fired um, elements to it. Um, the the definition of system events changed slightly and it split things out into late system connection events. So that is where, where ESCOM connects you late and, um, and system unavailability events. That is when the, the grid is simply not available to take your power. As I said, force majeure has been expanded to include things like the COVID pandemic. And it's in, in my view, a much better definition of force majeure under the risk mitigation program than existed under the REAP program. So, Perhaps in round five, we'll see the definition of force majeure from this power purchase agreement coming into the, the REAP round five PPA. I think that's all that, um, that we need to say about the risk mitigation um, uh, PPA. Perhaps, perhaps one other element would be this. this. Uh, we are at uh, 10 to now. I, I would like to give you the next five minutes to conclude so that we can use the balance of Good. the time to cover the Q&A. Understood. I'll take two okay. minutes. Thanks, Jason. Marlies, could you move to the next slide, please? Um, and the next. Let's get to the slide on the implementation agreement. So just to explain what's inside the implementation agreement, there's some really important clauses which I'd like to point out to you. One is government support. We spoke about that before, and that is where the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy steps in and makes payment after a particular process if ESCOM has been unable to make a payment to you as an, as an IPP. That is a very important clause and banks, I think, are, um, are very much in need of that assurance from government that ESCOM's payments will be backstopped by government um, because of some of the financial, financial issues that ESCOM has faced of late. Then one of the biggest things under the implementation agreement is Schedule 2 economic development obligations. And those are um, all of the undertakings that the seller makes um, in, in relation to economic development. There are provisions around corrupt acts and the consequences of corrupt acts. There is a, a clause that is quite important about refinancing and um, under the renewable energy program to date, um, you've been able to refinance without consent from government as long as you don't increase the tenor or the quantum of the debt. But now any refinancing will need the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy's consent and you will, you will also need to follow what is known as the refinancing protocol, which you can find on the IPP uh, website. Um, and that, that entails a 50-50 gain sharing and a potential reduction in tariff if there are benefits from refinancing. And then finally, uh, change of control and, and black ownership is, is restricted. So there's a certain period of time before which you, or within which you cannot change your control of your project. And if you are going to change shareholdings, including black shareholding, you'll need to seek the consent of the department in order to do so. Possibly the most important clause for lenders of, of this, well, also for sponsors 
of the implementation agreement is what happens when there's a government default and there's a termination payment that gets made that covers uh, your debt and equity. And so, so where government defaults on the project, um, they will give you a substantial payment and we, which will go a long way to making you whole. Um, if we could move to the next slide, I've got a couple of diagrams about economic development. Let's go to the next slide and the next and the next. So this shows the, if you go back one, please, Marilise, this shows the weighting of, of some of the elements uh, as between REAP round four and the risk mitigation program. And it shows that um, equal weighting is attached to job creation, local content, ownership, and management control. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, um, the risk mitigation program has a new uh, element called skills development and um, preferential procurement and enterprise development as it was under um, bid window four has been consolidated into enterprise and supplier development under the risk mitigation program. And then socioeconomic development has a particular weighting um, which seemingly was higher in, in REAP round four than it was in the risk mitigation program. Next slide, please. This shows you that um, South African entity participation under REAP round four was required to be a minimum of 40%. Um, but in the risk mitigation program, it is required to be a minimum of 49%. So that is an interesting change. And maybe that change will be pulled through into round five of REAP. Job creation, you'll see that under the risk mitigation uh, program, the numbers have increased steadily across all of those different categories of employees. Next slide, please. This uh, speaks to ownership on the left-hand side, and that shows also an increase um, in the ownership thresholds. So, for example, for the project company, you'll see shareholding by black people in the cellar. The target was 12% under REAP. It is 30% under the risk mitigation program. So it may be that under REAP round five, we'll see an increased black ownership target. So we'll have to wait for the RFP to see whether that happens. And then interestingly, local content under both REAP and risk mitigation uh, programs, the local content threshold is 40% of your spend during the construction phase needs to be on local content. And um, in the risk mitigation program, there have been some questions around whether that is actually achievable in certain types of technologies. So that all that remains to be seen. And the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition is the department that is monitoring that um, very carefully. Next slide, please. Um, this speaks to some of the other criteria, skills development, socioeconomic development, preferential procurement, and you'll see that there's an increase from REAP to the risk mitigation program, which likely indicates that we'll get increases in these requirements for REAP round five or so. Next slide. That, that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for paying attention and for and for listening and for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. Uh, that was really, really insightful. And we, we're learning quite a lot today. Uh, I've been seeing questions uh, in the Q&A and in the chat function. And I would like to say thank you to all our panelists for making time to participate in this. And before I disappear, I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Division Governor, who's the CEO of Sapia, to facilitate the Q&A session and uh, bring us to the close of the session today. Over to you, Nivesh. Yeah. Uh, actually, firstly, thank the, uh, the participants for the questions. And secondly, thank you to the speakers. I see the speakers today have been very proactive in answering the questions, so they've made my job a little bit easier. They asked a few questions that I want to pose to the panel. Uh, the first one may be for Alistair. Um, so there's a question on how the Department of Environmental Affairs uh, monitors uh, commencement of construction under the environmental authorization. Can they take action on a proponent, pro proponent uh, if only very limited early works commence very slowly over an extended period uh, until the full construction program commences. Is there precedence of this kind of thing that happens? Uh, so 
to the, the authorization not to expire. And I think mm -hmm. the second part of that question is on the water use license. Uh, is the Department of Water Affairs currently accepting and processing these water use licenses ahead of preferred bidder announcements? Okay, on, on the first question, uh, your environmental authorization that you issued with will um, have a, an expiry time frame. So it will be issued, let's say, probably these days, I think it's about three years. Um, and as we know, a lot of developers um, conceptualize their projects, they apply for the environmental authorization, and then we sit and wait for, for a bid window to open. And, and all the, in the meantime, your, your environmental, the timeframes on your environmental authorization are, um, are running, running out. And the process that you have to go through is to apply for an extension, and, and there's no issues with that. Um, once you've been elected a preferred bidder and your environmental authorization remains valid, um, then you um, have to commence obviously with, with construction. And the commencement of one listed activity, so your environmental authorization will authorize all the, the applicable listed activity, but the commencement of one listed activity. So essentially the, the, the placing of this the spade in the sand, the, the ceremonial placing of the spade in the sand um, is the commencement of all listed activities. So if your process or your construction process is does commence but is delayed for whatever reason, that is not going to have an effect on your environmental authorization. Um, but as, as Jason mentioned in, in his discussion, and, and excuse me if I'm, if I'm incorrect here, but that obviously does have implications on, on, you, on your other contractual obligations and under the, the REAP program, um, which, which could have a, have a, have a knock-on effect. But in terms of the environmental authorization, um, that, that's not, not, a, not a concern. And, and uh, what do you... The water use license, um, it's a question I get asked time and time again, what is, what is the department doing? The experience out there from, um, from developers, um, from bidders, is that the department is not um, accepting um, applications for water use license applications um, until such time that projects are uh, elected as, as preferred bidders. Um, but as I mentioned, the department is now recognizing the need for all these processes, uh, application processes to be aligned. Um, and so what, what they are saying is that you can take your public participation process from your environmental authorization and you can apply that to your water use license application process. So long as when you are doing your um, environmental authorization, you are identifying the water use issues during that process. So if your public participation process doesn't cover your water use license um, issues or your water use issues, then you couldn't, you can't then tap into that process during your, your water use license application process. So you've got to make sure that whatever you do during your, during your environmental authorization process is, is concerned, and you want to tap into that later down the line during your water use license application, make sure you cover the water use issues during that process. And then hopefully by the time we get to some sort of um, but in process, uh, the departments of human settlements and water and sanitation will have got their act into gear. They would have re revised the, the uh, water use license application regulations, and we will be dealing with that 90 day time period. So um, hopefully the concerns around being unable to submit um, applications prior to being elected as a preferred bidder will have somewhat fallen away, but that does not remove the concerns around whether the department itself will be able to stick to um, that 90 day time frame. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, I know a lot of the questions have been answered, so we will try to consolidate them and send them out with the slide pack to everyone so you have all have sight of the answers. Uh, but one I want to bring back uh, to Kazile is the one on communal land or community owned land. 
uh, other experiences uh, that we've seen where community owned land has been used for uh, IPP projects. Uh, how, how would one acquire this land and what kind of lease agreement will be structured with community owned or communal, or communal land? Hi. Um, so in my experience, I actually, I, I haven't seen that. And I guess the challenge is, it's not clear then who actually owns the, the land. So who, how would you actually then structure the agreement? Because who, would, who are the two contracting parties in that, um, in that lease agreement? And it becomes very challenging then um, from, a, from, from a department perspective, but even from a funding perspective, because if I have no certainty of who actually um, has, who actually owns that land, it, it becomes very difficult to then build an entire 1 billion power plant on this land. So, um, so from my experience, I haven't, I haven't come across any projects on communal land. So I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, my take is that I think there'd be a challenge given the, own, the, the, the uncertainty in terms of who actually, who's the entity or who actually owns it. Um, but I haven't come across it. I don't know if perhaps Jason or, or Alistair have come across something like that and how that would be dealt with. But my view um, would be, I guess the simple answer would be no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's something that, um, like just from a risk perspective, I, 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 I'd, I'd really be challenged to, 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 to use communal land, but I don't know if the, the other, the other panelists have got opposing views. Nothing from my side, uh, Tokazile. I agree with what you just said, Tokazile, 100%. If there's a challenge, uh, if there's, if there's ambiguity around who actually owns the land, and the quality of those rights for the 20 year PPA term is going to be very difficult for DMRE to procure the project and very difficult for the lenders to, to fund the project. Good. Thank you for that, guys. One more question to Alistair. So, we're talking about the environmental impact assessments. Uh, you've noted in your presentation that it takes 300 uh, days to get through this uh, process. For the risk mitigation program, will it be fast tracked? That's the first question. And secondly, for smaller projects uh, that are on red uh, land and outside of red lands, would this uh, take less time? Um, the, the environmental authorization process is extremely strict. Um, it, it does not, other than the dispensation that's already been provided for um, by, by the department in terms of um, designating the the reds, um, there's, there's no other fast tracking of, of time frames, and, and there's no, no real way of, of, of getting around, around those time frames. So, yeah, yeah you know, in environmental authorization has become such critical steps in, 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 in any development. I mean, we can go out even outside of, of the renewable energy sphere here. Um, and, and, and there's just no way of, of getting around it. Um, and the only way I, I think is, is, and the reds were declared under this, I think it's called the Strategic Development Act, um, is if the, the, the president himself uh, makes uh, or publishes a, a notice under the Strategic Development Act um, to, to provide some sort of special dispensation. Um, and I, I'm, I don't think that has occurred under, under this risk mitigation um, document. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's short answer, no, no way around those timeframes. Sorry, and then, and then the second question. So he's asking for smaller projects. So for, Look, uh, for it, say a 20 all, megawatt project. It all, so um, it all boils down to thresholds. Um, you're, you're, you know, you've got um, under listing notice one, the, um, the thresholds are um, 10 to 20 megawatts. Um, and then you trigger listing notice one, list, uh, listed activity one under listing notice one. But even then, I think that there's there's a threshold no to ten megawatts. Um, so, yeah, there's 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 very little little way around it um, on 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 thresholds. But it's all looking at the specifics of a project, um, looking at, at the, all the listed uh, activities and all the listing notices, and and looking at the thresholds provided for in, in those. And you know that's what you do hand in hand with your your environmental assessment practitioner. 
and and you you make that determination to see where you can can get around some of the thresholds by changing the scope of the project and 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 trying to fall below the thresholds but in terms of megawatt output there's 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 very little way around that Alison, before you go, I see there's a last uh, minute question that's come up on the wake effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so in your opinion, can DEF require that a wake effect assessment uh, be included in the EIA uh, to access the impact, uh, to assess the impact of projects uh, that are still under development and not yet preferred bidders? Well, I mean, they, I know, I'm, it's my understanding that Sawyer it has been an engagement with the department on on the issue of wake effect because obviously they're representative of of, of the sector, um, and and when when I discussed this with with a client of mine, he, he said as as far as he's understood, um, the department has not given any has not made any statement to swear to say well we absolutely require a, a, a wake assessment as part of an environmental authorization and that's the experience that that my clients who you have gone through this process and have been have had their environmental authorizations the subject matter of appeals at no point in the process did the department turn around and say to them well we want you to do a, a, a wake assessment they issued the environmental authorization, and it was only once the an appeal was was appeals had been submitted against the environmental authorization, um, and and the minister was forced to to make a decision on those appeals that they've started essentially setting a precedent. So you know what I'm saying as part of this is you know, rather don't take the risk. Uh, do your wake assessment. Uh, you, you only do your wake assessment, obviously, if you've got a neighboring existing neighboring facility. You don't do a wake assessment if um, there's no existing facility in close proximity, because well, you're not going to. There's no wake effect to assess. Um, but my my word of caution is is, is do it, um, even if the department isn't hasn't come out with a firm stance on it to say it has to form part of well i mean in effect they have put a firm stance on it in, in the form of two two um very concise uh, appeals on the issue but in terms of coming out with with a statement to the, the representative body um they haven't so but do it is <laughs> is thank it's, you it's, it's the summary Thank you so much. I think just to wrap it up, uh, Jason, if I can bring you in, I see there's a lot of questions and you've done a really good analysis uh, of, of comparison between the REAP round four and the risk mitigation. And a lot of questions are coming up on the PPA and the um, implementation agreement. Uh, if you had to take out your, your glass ball and look into the future of round five, and I know uh, lawyers are very conservative and hate to do this, but I'm gonna put you on the spot anyways. Uh, if you had to take out the, the glass ball and look into round five, uh, do you see any material changes in those PPAs and uh, implementation agreements? Or can you give an opinion on whether you think the round four, uh, as that was structured, is a better way of doing it, or the risk mitigation in terms of how that was structured is a better way of doing it? So my, my thoughts on that are that the risk mitigation power purchase agreement is a very different animal than the REAP PPA. Um, the risk mitigation uh, PPA deals with an entirely different technology solution. So everything that's linked to that technology solution cannot come across into the REAP PPA. But there are certain improvements that I think have been made to the REAP PPA and the risk mitigation program, like the force majeure clause, like the system events clause. Um, those things are, are actual improvements, which actually I think would, would be well suited to the future um, uh, REAP round five PPA. Um, but it remains to be seen how many of those elements will come across. Likely we'll see things like um, force majeure, system events, compensation events, unforeseeable conduct, and the introduction of a whole new concept of change in law um, coming into the um, coming into the REAP round five PPA. Good, uh, thank you for that. Uh, just to reiterate that we have received all of the questions, they have been answered online. Uh, we will try to consolidate them and send them out with the slide pack so everyone has access to them if, if they've missed it. Uh, and thank you to the speakers. Uh, thanks, Antonio.
Uh, thanks, Niveshin. Thanks to the speakers and thanks to the participants. We have come to at the end of our program. And I would like to encourage the participants to please follow our series of, um, of webinars uh, still on this topic of developing developers. You can see on the screen uh, the dates for up upcoming events. And we have our next one on the 12th of November, uh, which will focus on finance and bankability to financial close. And then on the 10th of December, we'll do the socioeconomic impact. Uh, in January, we'll do project development. And uh, February, we'll do engineering procurement and construction. And then we we'll close off with O&M and asset management on the 18th of March. So thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to see you in our next uh, webinar. Great. <laughs>